Thank you, Miles. Really appreciate that. Well, today we embark on a new series entitled Faith Steps, how God proves himself strong. And just want to begin by unpacking uh, the background to uh, this title. The storyline of the Bible is the storyline of faith. And the subtitle here, How God Proves Himself Strong, is from 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 16, verse 9, where it says this, The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. That verse is set in a context of a king by the name of Asa, who saw in an occasion his problem to be bigger than his God. And it was a failure of faith because it was a failure in faith in the capacity and the trustworthiness of God. See, the point simply is this. Life's challenges are the proving ground of my grasp of the greatness of God. And faith in his capacity unleashes his blessing. And that is a blessing that we need as individuals. And that is a blessing that we need as a church. And that is a blessing that by the grace of God, we can pursue with abandon and see him do great things as we learn to take steps of faith. Let's pray as we begin. Father, as we embark on this journey, we pray that, that you would engage us, that you would meet with us through your word in a very unusual and significant way that this would result in us having defining moments of stepping out and doing that next right thing that we know you have called us to do. We pray that our time today would facilitate that, that our time today would be a day where we not simply learn your truth, but we apply it and we exercise it in our lives and glorify you and humbly receive your blessing because of that. And so we pray this for the cause and the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, who makes that possible. Amen. Well, today in particular, what we want to do when we talk about faith steps, we're talking about forward motion. And, and what we want to look at here this morning is simply how to get off on the right foot. And so what we're going to be doing as we work our way through this series is we're going to be unpacking the lives of a variety of biblical personalities, people uh, in the Bible. We're going to try as best we can to do it chronologically. We might sometimes skip ahead in light of a particular emphasis we might want for a, a particular day, but we're going to try to do it as best we can chronologically in looking at these different people. And uh, today we start at ground zero. Uh, today we start with the first personality of the Bible on a human scale, and that being the man, Adam. It's interesting when you look at the Bible and you study various people, oft times uh, we will have uh, sermons about different personalities. But what's important that we understand is that oft times these sermons, these messages that we hear about personalities in the Bible, they often fall short. Uh, because the Bible is much bigger than just about people in the Bible. We'll have these stories, for instance, like with David, you know, David loved God. David slew giants. Be like David. Uh, while that is well and good, what we do need to understand is that while the Bible, while the storyline of the Bible is a storyline of faith, it is faith in an object. And that object is God. You see, the purpose of the, the many faith stories that we're going to be looking at in the course of this study is not so much to teach us about people, but rather it is about our need to learn about God. And so that's the journey that we embark on. And as we learn about God today, we're going to be learning about him by how he responded and what he did on behalf of this man we call Adam. Well, in light of that, how to get off on the right foot, 
First of all, I must understand the essence of faith. Take your Bibles and meet me in Genesis chapter 1 if you're uh, not there already. Genesis uh, chapter uh, 1. Because here what we see is, is truly the essence of what faith is. And while the word faith is not referenced in what we're going to be looking at, this is all about the foundation on which faith is uh, built. And so we're introduced to this man by the name of Adam in verse 26 of chapter 1. And know what it says there. If you look at chapter 1, verse uh, 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. And you're saying, wait, that's not the word Adam. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, the word Adam is the word man. Adam is the word for man. And so here we see the first reference to um, Adam, and his name is man. He is man. And know what we see here as we go on. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And then verse 28 is what we want to camp on. Then God blessed them, and God said to them. This is an amazing thing. God said to them. See, God does something right now that he does not do with anything else. He talks to them. What's significant about that? You see, God knew that even though Adam and Eve were perfect people living in perfect relationship with him, they could not figure out life on their own. They were created to be dependent on his word. God had to explain who they were and the, what they were to do with their lives. They didn't need this help because they were sinners. Sin hasn't happened yet. They needed this help because they were human. You see, here's the point. Adam and Eve were created to be revelation receivers. They were given communicative abilities that no other creature was given. They were created with the ability to hear, to understand, and apply God's words to their lives. And these abilities were not given primarily to encourage human relationships. They were given so that we could know God and understand him and please him with lives of grateful obedience. Genesis chapter 1 confronts me with the fact that my need for help preceded sin. I you, we all were created to be dependent upon the direction, the word of God. And trying to live without God's help is to assign myself a subhuman existence. It is to live like an animal, as if I were something other than what I am. Vast numbers of people attempt to live this way, but it is an act of irrationality. They deny their identity, they subvert their own lives, and they crush their own hope. Human beings were created to live by faith on the platform of God's revelation, which is why we were given the unique communication abilities that we possess. The point with all this? Faith steps must begin with a humble recognition of the inescapable nature of our need to hear and know God's word. If there had been no fall, if we had never sinned, we would still need help because we're human. You see, the essence of your creative dignity 
is to step out in faith on the truth of God's word and to walk by faith in the clarity of God's word. Faith is resolute confidence in the trustworthiness of God. Faith is living in a hope that is so real it gives absolute assurance. Faith is not simply one way to please God. It is the only way to please God. So how to get off on the right foot? I must understand the essence of faith. It is taking God at his word and responding to it. Well, we go on and we see not only is our need to understand and know that, but we also get off on the right foot by owning our need. And here's where we come to Genesis <coughs> chapter 3 and chapter 4 as you go through the creation account. And my attention in this sermon this morning is, is so much that is, is here. And what we're first unpacking is, is the story of Adam. Next, we're going to unpack the theology of Adam. But ongoing with the story of Adam here in Genesis chapter 3, everything hits the fan. And, and what happens here in Genesis chapter 3 is rather than believing in the word of God, they believe the word of the snake, the serpent. Years ago, I was counseling an individual who was struggling in a variety of ways, and the primary way that he was struggling was uh, he was a businessman, and it was a family business, and um, one of uh, the individuals in his business was responsible for uh, the demise of that family business. And I will never forget, I'll never forget the tone of his voice, the anguish of his heart as, as he said, my brother wrecked our business. I don't know why that just stuck with me, that word wrecked. And as I was studying this week, that story came back to my mind because it really pictures to some degree what we have going on in Genesis chapter 3. Because in Genesis chapter 3, what we need to understand is this, and this is really critical. Sin did not just cripple me, it wrecked me. It wrecked me in a comprehensive way. It, if this was a car accident, it totaled me. Well, how did it total us? Well, it totaled me, first of all, in my character. Note in chapter 3, as you go on, and the fall happens, and, and uh, they are found out, and they run, and they hide, and God is now addressing them. And you come to verse uh, 12 of chapter 3, where as God questions him, here what we have is uh, the first class in classic blame shifting 101 being taken. Verse 12, chapter 3, Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave of the tree, and I ate. See, here what we have happening in light of the devastation of what happened, it affected Adam's character. Adam blames God for giving him the woman, and then he blames Eve for giving him the fruit. You see, and down throughout history, nothing's changed. We continue to blame God and others for the choices that we have made in life. See, the point simply is this. Our hope is often to find the answer to our problems in the failure of others. We continue to run away from the obvious that we are guilty and accountable for the decisions and choices that we have made in life. Sin wrecks our character. Sin also wrecks us in our work. It's fascinating you come to verse 17 through verse 19 where the curse is enacted and know what it says there then starting in verse 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread 
till you turn to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. There's so much going on here that we don't have time to unpack, but here we simply have the curse of work. And, and there's a thir- threefold uh, distortion that now uh, encapsulates us with reference to our work. First of all, underbalance, where we would refuse to work or, or we, uh, we don't work. There's the problem of imbalance in our work today, where, where people find their identity in their work. You know, it's fascinating when you, when you engage a conversation with someone how oft times is it that soon into that conversation you ask, so what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I'm a such and such, or I'm a such. We find so much identity in our work. That is one of the curses of what happens here in Genesis 3. And then there's also the problem, the distortion of overbalance, whereby we bury ourselves in our work due to a preoccupation with, with getting things getting ahead for our status or, or getting away to avoid responsibility. A lot of guys, they're very good at what they do on their job, but they're not so good at things around the house in light of inside the house and relationships. And so to avoid that responsibility, they bury themselves in their work. It's a problem that's been plaguing man. And so that which was intended to be a blessing now becomes a bane. Sin did not just cripple me, it wrecked me not only in my character and in my work, but in my consequences. Verse 24, and again, there's so much going on here, but note verse 24, where we read this. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, that's uh, that's a reference to the judgment of God, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That consequence, we, we are banished from paradise. And, and now we live the rest of our days searching for that paradise, but we're banished from it. And then finally, sin did not just cripple me, it wrecked me. And this is probably the most sobering way in which sin has wrecked us. It has wrecked me in my essence. You see, now, because we are created in the image of God, like him, we have creative capacity to produce children, offspring. Offspring whereby we pass down to them an eternal soul. And we not only give them life, but we give them our depravity. And now their natural, spiritual default is not the paradise of heaven, but banishment to hell. That is the essence of our legacy in Adam and how sin wrecked us. But praise God, right before man was banished from paradise, God makes an unbelievable gracious provision. Their innocence is shattered And they scattered and hid in guilt and shame. Their own efforts to cover up was was woefully inadequate. And note what we see in verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. I wonder what it might have been like for Adam as he shamefully stood before his creator and then watched in horror as God took an innocent victim, killed it, and butchered it so that he could once again stand before his creator without shame. 
it must have been unbelievably sobering. Well, that's the story of Adam. Let's now flip the page and uh, learn from the theology of Adam. And I invite you to go to the New Testament to a primary passage where we learn about Adam theologically that we need to understand and apply to our lives here. Because what we see here in Romans chapter 5 is, is the most um, uh, detailed explanation of the theology behind all of this story that we've just looked at in the early chapters of Genesis. Because what we see now in here in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, are, are four features of Adam's awful legacy. Uh, let's unpack them. What we see, first of all, is simply this. What did Adam do? He introduced sin into the world. We see in chapter 5, the first part of verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world. It's not saying here that sin originated with Adam. Sin originated with Satan, who the scripture says in John, 1 John, he has, is the one who sinned from the beginning. You see, sin entered into the human realm through Adam. And note here how sin is singular, it's not plural. It's not sins, plural. You see, here, sin is, is not representative of a singular wrong act, but rather it's talking about how sin entered the world. It's talking about the sin nature that he came to possess because of this first disobedience. And sin entered. You see, God made men with a procreative, as a procreative race. And when they procreate, they pass on to their children and to their children's children their own nature, physical, psychological, and spiritual. And so when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he sinned not only as a man, but as man. He introduced sin into the world. The second feature of his awful legacy is that death entered the world through sin. And so we go on and the scripture says, and death through sin. It was the opening of the dike that produced this flood of sin. It was the poison that penetrated every unit of life. See, death is the unfailing fruit of the poison of sin. And that's why even tragically today, babies will die. It's not because they have committed sins, but because they have an inherited sin nature, the ultimate consequence of which is death. No one escapes that awful curse. And you do not become a sinner by committing sins, but rather you commit sins because you are by nature a sinner. Third feature of his awful legacy is that death spread to all men because all sinned, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, sin brings three kinds of death to people. Spiritual death, which is separation from God. Physical death, which is separation from fellow human beings. And then eternal death, which is separation from all hope and eternal torment in the lake of fire. And unbelievers have every reason to fear all three of these deaths. Spiritual death prevents earthly happiness. Physical death prevents any further opportunity for spiritual rescue and salvation. And eternal death will bring everlasting punishment. And then the fourth feature of Adam's awful legacy is that history proves that death reigns over all men. Verse 13 and 14, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. You see, the fact that the face of this earth is pockmarked with graves 
is the incontestable testimony that all men, whatever their wealth, their status, or accomplishments, are subject to death. Well, that's the bad news. That's what we learn from this first human being. That's the legacy. Not very hopeful. But the story does not stop here. Because what we learn about God is an unbelievable truth in him sending to us a solution. And that solution is in Jesus Christ, who theologians call the second Adam. And as we work our way here through the rest of Romans chapter 5, uh, what we see are, are five essential uh, contrasts. In contrast to the legacy, uh, the awful legacy of Adam that reigned unto death, now Christ has an unbelievable legacy that reigns to life. And we come to verse 15 here of chapter 5, and we have this beautiful three-letter word, but... It's, it's in the Greek here. It's the strongest contrastive conjunction that there can be. This is a 180. In contrast to this guy, here is this one. But note what we see here in these five essential areas of contrast. First of all, the contrast in effectiveness. But, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. You see, the point here is this. Christ's one act of salvation had immeasurably greater impact than Adam's one act of damnation. Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to destroy. We have not only the contrast in effectiveness, we have the contrast in extent. Note verse 16 where it says, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. See, this teaches two truths. First of all, God hates sin so much. It only took one sin to condemn the entire world. It was simply that the first sin was sin. And secondly, greater even than God's hatred of sin is his love for the sinner. The contrast in extent we also see here the contrast in, in efficacy. It's talking about the capacity to produce a desired result here. Note, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ in light of that deliberate act of offense, much more Jesus Christ is effective. And then we have here the contrast in essence. Verse 18 and verse 19 where we see this. Therefore, as though, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even through, so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. I love the old hymn that says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And then finally here in these great contrasts, in the solution of his son, Jesus Christ, we have the contrast in energy. Note verse 20 and verse 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, 
even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, what we learn in the theology behind the story here in Romans chapter 5 is Christ, the second Adam, is much more powerful to save than Adam was to destroy. So, it comes down to this. What's tripping you up? What's tripping you up from your needed next step of faith? Well, going back and reviewing briefly and looking at this question, here's some needed thoughts. Are you listening to snake theology? Are you doubting right now the goodness of God and his ability to see you through? Are you, are you doubting the trustworthiness of God? Our forefather, Adam, he did just that. Are you questioning the character of God? Very important, you discern who you're listening to right now in light of what you have on your plate in life. It's a fascinating play of words in Genesis where it talks about, in the original language, how they were nude. And then the serpent came who was shrewd. And he promised them that they could too be shrewd like God. And they fell for it and then realized they were nude. You see, listening to snake theology is all about one agenda, and that is your guilt, and that is about your shame. Are you owning it? Do you have a PhD in blame shifting with reference to the choices that you've made? minimizing them? Or do you own the fact that your standing before God is not just crippled, it's wrecked. It's wrecked. That's the true essence of who you are as man. Are you all about paradise present? You see, we are created. We are created with a longing for paradise. But that longing that God blessed us with in our initial creative design, a longing for paradise, now it cannot be found in the here and now. But what we do is spend our entire lives looking for paradise in a place that it can't be found in because we've been banished from it. See, that's why you today might be up to your ears and beyond in debt because you're trying to find paradise in the things of this world in the food of this world, in the entertainment of this world, and you're just buying and buying and buying. Why is that? It's because you have a theology resident in your heart that is longing for paradise, but you're blind to the fact that it's not here and it's not now. That's why so many marriages are falling apart today. We get Twitter pated and we get all, all amped up about these wonderful, ushy gushy emotions of, of, of love. But the problem is that romantic love has a very short shelf life. Romantic love can't stretch, it, it only shatters. But so many people go into this, this, this institution called marriage and thinking it's finally going to be paradise. For me, it took about a month, and I realized, nope, it's not going to happen. Some of you have had those similar kind of wake-up calls. 
but, but that's why there's so much difficulty today in that human relationship wherein sin landed because people are looking for paradise in the wrong places. Are you looking for paradise in your career? It was that career that is going to give you satisfaction and meaning and status and all that stuff, and now you dread the reality that Monday morning is coming and that alarm is going to go off. You see, only steps of faith in the Word of God keeps you looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Paradise. Paradise is coming. It's not right now. Are you under the reign of Jesus? I love the last verse there of Romans 5 where it says this, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, everyone by faith submits their will to one of two ways. You will submit your will to the way of Adam that leads to the way of death. Or you will submit your will to the way of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, that leads to life. And God proves himself strong. He rescues, he transforms, he makes brand new lives that have been wrecked by sin through the purging and the forgiveness and the cleansing and the infusion of eternal life because of the victory of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Have you bowed your knee in surrender to his will and his way. Let's pray. Father, this is a sobering journey this morning for us. Adam is that of a sad legacy, but it's the legacy that we first must own if we're going to experience eternal life. And we pray that if there's someone here this morning who has yet, who has never surrendered their will and their way to that of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that they would discover how you prove yourself strong in their eternal rescue. We praise you for your provision of your son, an innocent victim who was butchered and shed his blood so that we could be washed, we could be made clean we could be made forever brand new and we look forward to seeing what you're going to continue to do in our midst as you prove yourself strong as the savior of people's lives we ask this in jesus great name amen we say this each and every sunday that there's always an open invitation here, and we don't know where you might be in your spiritual journey. But if we can help you in light of questions you have, in light of struggles that you might be having, and, and disappointments and discouragements, and, and things like you know you've been going and looking for paradise in the wrong places, how you can get out of that dark valley of the shadow of death. It would be our privilege to help you to learn and grow in the truth of God's word. By faith, believe it and obey it and see how God will prove himself strong in your life. We would look forward to meeting with you. We'd love to have you reach out to us and get in touch with us at your earliest convenience. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. We have our adult Bible fellowship hour next that we can continue to learn on growing. There's a variety of classes throughout the building. We'd love to have you stay for that. You're dismissed.